Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today in person and online. Hello, Eric. Uh, he will be joining us remotely. Also, thanks to KI and especially Clint and Andy for organizing this very interesting multi-panel discussion. My name is Jungmin Kim, lead correspondent and K News and editorial director at Korea Pro, and I'm delighted and honored to moderate this session with our valued contributors today. And looking forward to hearing your insights. Uh, for this session, I'm pleased to be joined by Carl Friedhoff from the Chicago Council on Girl Global Affairs, Jennifer Ahn from Council on Foreign Relations, Eric Mobrand online uh, from RAND Corporation, and Boram Kwan from Korea Institute for Defense Analyses. Um, and before going into the presentations, um, just to set the scene for a couple of minutes, um, we just looked at the historical context and we uh, saw the domestic context being mentioned here and there, and that's what we're, uh, we're going to talk about. South Korea is an increasingly polarized society with a mix of nationalistic features, but prioritization of US alliance above all diplomatic relations. And we have had a new conservative administration for the past year as North Korea updated its nuclear doctrine delivery system um, to potentially use tactical nuclear weapons against South Korea. So there has been an increase of tension on the Korean Peninsula. And as someone who's monitoring the National Assembly and the presidential office every hour, every minute, um, for work, the, the tones and context of the recent nuclear armament discussion among the political elites, it was very, it was quite curious um, and intriguing. And the argument used to be considered um, extreme or fringe in South Korea for years, but in the past few months, we saw a very notable uptick in high profile um, politicians, including my own president, as well as experts and media articles talking about it. Um, and our panel will help us make sense of why uh, poll results are the way uh, they are right now and what the factors are that drive such perception in South Korea and the dynamics in which the discourse shapes uh, in the domestic political context. And reminder, you can read their papers on KR website. Um, and after speaking 10 minutes maximum each, uh, we'll then move on to a moderated discussion and Q&A. And without further ado, uh, let's hear from our uh, contributors. And over to you, Carl. Uh, thank you, Jungmin. And, and thanks to KEI for, for organizing everything. Um, you know, I, I, I was going to start off by talking about kind of how this debate is not really a Korean debate, it's more, more trans-Pacific debate because there is no debate uh, currently ongoing. And that, that raises questions in, in itself why the Democratic Party is, is not speaking up at this moment to oppose what has mostly been a conservative movement. Uh, I think that's a, a broader question that I think Eric may deal with uh, more broadly, seeing as his, his, his paper kind of kicks off uh, with that. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the public opinion piece of this. Right? I think by now we, we largely know the numbers. We've all seen that it's generally 70%. Uh, it's been that way for about a decade. It doesn't fluctuate very much, and that's it's kind of insensitive to question wording uh, as well. If you add in, you know, should, should South Korea develop nuclear weapons because North Korea has them, 70%. If you add in, or if you exclude the North Korea part of this, still 70%. It uh, doesn't really go up based on, on what North Korea is doing. There was a brief dip in the number after the, the summit uh, between Trump and Kim Jong-un, but then it immediately went back up once it looked like that summit was not really going to, to accomplish anything. And I would not suspect any kind of dip like that to be repeated now that the public has kind of been through uh, one of those things. I would note that this number is very close to the ceiling. So 70 to 75 percent is probably as, as high as it's ever going to get. And that's largely because the 25 to 30 percent who are opposed are largely opposed on moral grounds. And they're very hard to shift. But what will happen, and I think it's going to be a little more difficult to track, is the number might change below the surface. So respondents will go from somewhat support to strongly support. So at the top level, it'll still look like you know 70 to 75 percent. But you could see a hardening of positions uh, that will happen under uh, the surface. Uh, as for the drivers, I think this is one of the really difficult questions because largely within the data, we don't know what the drivers behind this are. Uh, when we look at kind of forward-looking things such as uh, future threats, so respondents who think that China is the biggest future threat versus respondents who think North Korea is the biggest future threat, their attitudes on nuclear weapons are almost the same. So there's not real, real differentiation based on how the perception of the region uh, is, is breaking down. There's also the factor of U.S. credibility. We've talked quite a bit about this uh, this morning. And interestingly, those numbers actually move together. 
So respondents who see the U.S. as more credible are more likely to support a U.S. nuclear weapons program. And this is something that Lauren Sukin has called the unwanted use theory, that the South Korean public is afraid that the U.S. will escalate too quickly, and therefore they want to have control of the, the nuclear weapon decision so that they'll be, uh, be able to control the escalatory cycle. Um, whether or not that is, is correct or not needs further study, but within the numbers, those numbers are correlated in a way that, that I think um, is more convincing than looking at this from a future threat uh, perspective. There's also an issue of, of, because we can't really identify a forward-looking piece of this, there's also an issue of perhaps this is backwards-looking. Uh, so I was talking to someone one recently, and they brought up this 1992 book called the Mughunghwa uh, Gochi Piyosumida. It's a really famous book. I saw it sold about four million copies, and it kind of theorizes that the North and the South are working on a nuclear program together. Um, I think the, the theory that was brought up was that because this was, this was seen as a, a, way, a, a way of looking back to say, well, if we had continued a nuclear program from the 70s, perhaps we wouldn't be in the position that we are in now. In, in this predicament. And so maybe it's not future looking, maybe it's actually backwards looking and kind of this nostalgia for, for what may have been. So the, the short answer is, is that we don't know what's really driving it. And prestige also doesn't seem uh, to play a huge role. And the rest of the talk, uh, with apologies to our, our moderator, because I'm about to cut off a bunch of questions from not only her but also the audience, uh, I want to deal with the criticisms of the polling because I'm sure as I'm talking about these numbers, everyone is thinking the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna throw this out there so maybe we can move beyond them um, uh, through the Q&A. And you know, the criticisms of the polling basically haven't changed in the past 10 years. They've been exactly the same and they're always the same three things. Uh, the first one is that the public is not thinking about this. Okay, that's probably true. But when we look at presidential approval, is the public wandering around saying, well, kind of what's, what's the job performance of the president like? That's, you know, a little, that's a little more salient. Maybe a better example would be um, moving of the presidential office from the Blue House to Yongsan. You know, was, was the public really walking around thinking about that? But still, they were widely, widely opposed uh, to that. The difference is, is that no one was debating those numbers. Uh, they, those were just accepted. And I find that the debate on these numbers is because they're uncomfortable and they, we might not agree with him. And so therefore it's, well, we can't trust the numbers. How was the question asked? Was the sample right? When we don't see that, and when, when it's kind of any other thing, even though it's the same kind of methodology and everything else is, is largely the same. Uh, the second piece of this is the public doesn't understand the consequences. You now, okay, yes, probably true. I then turn the question back to everyone in this room. Does anyone here confidently know what the consequences are, are going to be? You know, and when we asked this question in, in one of our last reports, we asked about the, the likelihood of international sanctions. 80% of those who said they support a nuclear weapons program, 80% said yes, there would be international sanctions. Uh, sanctions from China, 81% said yes, there would be sanctions from China. And then on U.S. withdrawal, almost a 50-50 split for a total U.S. withdrawal of troops. Um, that to me does not seem that unreasonable and suggests that the public does have a fairly good understanding of what the consequences might be and can judge that. The issue is, is that even with those consequences, only 11% switched from supporting nuclear weapons <coughs> to not supporting nuclear weapons. So the, the, the support was fairly robust. Of course, we can get into maybe in Q&A, we can talk about some of the experiments that have been done and you know, why I'm, I'm not a huge fan of experiments. That's, that's a whole other, other issue. Um, and the final part of this is you know, that we should be careful with these numbers because by putting them out there, they can be taken advantage of by politicians, by people who are seeking to, to make political hay. I'm, I'm somewhat sympathetic uh, uh, to that argument. However, I would point out that these numbers have been out there for 10 years. You know, this, it's been the same for, for a decade, and this conversation is only happening now. Right? And I think part of the reason that it, it's happening now is obviously it's related to U.S. domestic politics. That there, I think we can not understate how how rattling the Trump administration was uh, for a lot of the senior policymakers in Korea as they, they started to think about this. Uh, but also, I find that the overall dismissal of the numbers from the last 10 years play, is part of this larger context of not wanting to take Korean concerns seriously, right? The numbers were out there, they were very clear, but what we heard over the past decade is, well, those aren't real, you know, this is not going to really come to fruition, and now suddenly the debate is upon us when we could have spent the last 10 years working towards uh, some of those things. So when, when we heard the previous uh, 
panel talking about you know more of the same as and I think that's this part of the context of why why this is as played out uh, as it has let me go I'll stop there thank you Carl Jennifer thank you Tungbin um, and thank you to KEI hello okay for inviting me to speak here today um, so my piece beyond US credibility concerns factors driving the nuclear weapons debate in South Korea provides an overview of the various factors at play within the nuclear debate in South Korea. And crucially, I look beyond South Korean concerns over US credibility and questions over whether the US would come to the defense of South Korea if US cities and citizens were at risk. Um, and when looking past concerns over US credibility and identifying the other factors at play, we can get a better understanding of the core of South Korean concerns and anxieties that underscore the high public support for nuclear weapons. Um, and there are five broad categories that my piece dives into, which are threat perceptions and policy options toward North Korea, perceived gaps in South Korean indigenous conventional capabilities, geopolitical developments, the weakening influence of normative restraints, and nationalist sentiment. So first, the North Korea factor can be broadly understood in two veins. First, the first involves advancements in North Korea's military capabilities that have altered the South Korean public's threat perceptions toward the North. The record number of missile test launches within the past year that indicate North Korea's new phase within its weapons program of prioritizing diversification, miniaturization, and deployment, along with the North Korean nuclear law of September 2022, both highlight the changing nature of the threat posed by North Korea's nuclear weapons. The second change is the growing public sentiment in South Korea that the denuclearization of the North is unfeasible or even impossible. Low prospects for denuclearization, along with declining or limited hopes for a successful dialogue and engagement, have led to calls for the abandonment of a policy toward North Korea that focuses on denuclearization as a short-term objective and replacing it with a policy of nuclear balance or parity with some proponents even arguing that only nuclear balance can achieve mutual denuclearization. The second factor relates to a South Korean belief that its conventional deterrence and defense capabilities are insufficient, insufficient against the increasingly sophisticated nature of North Korea's weapons program. The UN administration has revitalized implementing the three axis system as South Korea's primary response against North Korean attacks but gaps in the credibility and reliability of the three axes, particularly Korea air and missile defense, have led to questions over South Korea's ability to effectively demonstrate its conventional deterrence. South Korean perceptions of its lagging capabilities, particularly as North Korea continues to accelerate its military modernization, will continue to fuel these arguments for South Korea to invest in nuclear capabilities as a means of overcoming these gaps in conventional deterrence. The next factor, and one that was touched upon in the previous panel, looks at geopolitical developments that are shaping a new nuclear age of uncertainties um, and growing national insecurities in response to unpredictable global changes. The two main developments shaping this view are the war in Ukraine and a potential Taiwan contingency in the region. So first, the war in Ukraine has led to some in the South Korean public to argue that only possessing and the presence of nuclear weapons can deter an invasion. And the war has also indicated the difficulties of overpowering a nuclear armed country with conventional capabilities and carrying out an all-out offensive under the threat of nuclear escalation. And second, and perhaps more salient, is a potential Taiwan contingency or Chinese invasion of Taiwan, which would have serious implications for not only North Korea's ambitions on the Korean Peninsula, such as North Korea seeing an opportunity for renewed invasion of the South, but also South Korean thinking regarding whether deterrence can be successful without nuclear weapons. And this is particularly important because there have been parallels drawn between South Korea and Taiwan as both countries being targeted by nuclear armed states with historical and revisionist goals toward reunification. The fourth factor involves the weakening of two normative elements that have traditionally constrained South Korea's nuclearization, which are the 1992 Joint Declaration on the Denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula and the NPT. The 1992 Joint Declaration has been subject to call calls for its abandonment ever since North Korea tested its first nuclear weapon in 2006. Despite this, successive South Korean administrations, both progressive and conservative, have continued to uphold the principle of denuclearization outlined in the Declaration as a valuable norm underlying the goal toward peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula. 
Recently, however, South Korea's commitment to the agreement has come under increased pressure as a greater number of voices, including then interim chief of the ruling People Power Party, have called for South Korea to scrap the agreement if North Korea were to conduct its seventh nuclear test, arguing that only South Korea is tied to the principle of denuclearization. And alongside this declaration, the NPT serves as the main global agreement constraining South Korea's nuclear armament. Any South Korean argument to develop nuclear weapons has been most strongly opposed by critics, pointing to the likely consequences that would follow a unilateral South Korean decision to leave the NPT, including sanctions by the international community and damage to South Korea's economy. However, despite this, nuclear proponents argue that the sophisticated and offensive nature of North Korea's nuclear weapons and its program now explicitly threatens South Korea's survival and thus meets the conditions outlined by Article 10 of the NPT. The last factor that shapes South Korea's debate is nationalism. Nationalist arguments still point to North Korea as the primary reason for South Korea to go nuclear, but from an angle buttressed by nationalist pride. This argument outlines that North Korea is holding South Korea hostage with its nuclear weapons and that the Korean people are essentially prisoners under North Korea's nuclear blackmail. In this sense, North nuclear weapons are viewed as a necessary tool for weakening North Korea's perceived advantage in nuclear capabilities and its ability to control South Korean actions through nuclear provocations or coercion. Particularly as North Korea will likely continue to conduct provo provocations throughout this year that the international community may not be able to prevent, there will likely continue to be arguments that South Korea should invest and pursue nuclear capabilities for unquestionable military superiority against the North. Um, and before I conclude, it's important to note that the nuclear debate in South Korea in its current form thus far reflects uh, public perspe perspectives that might influence South Korea's future policy direction rather than a government-driven or government-initiated policy decision on nuclear development. So therefore, it's increasingly important for the U.S. and South Korea to cooperate within the alliance to respond to such sentiments or address such sentiments so that the costs and risks associated with a nuclear South Korea are factored into the debate. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Eric, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for this invitation to participate. And uh, thanks especially to Clint for the hard work in compiling and edit editing these papers. Uh, let me preface my talk with the disclaimer to say that these remarks are my own and do not in any way represent uh, RAND Corporation. I'd like to draw attention to the performative or theatrical dimension to our subject today. And this is because media and politicians in Korea are at the ready to report on discussion of this issue, whether that discussion takes place in Korea or here in the US. Expert views and supposedly objective research findings can stamp approval on perspectives in ways that can be mobilized for influence and attention within Korea. Media groups and politicians are especially eager to use or misuse comments coming from the United States because they can be given extra weight. So we get headlines in Korea that read things like US expert says Korea can get nuclear weapons when such a person maybe did not exactly say that. But these headlines serve news organizations desire for exciting headlines. What this means is that commenting on this issue is not a neutral exercise, but it also means that the thing we're studying, the thing we're talking about today has been shaped by previous comments on it. And this makes it a bit tricky. That nuclear acquisition is an issue in Korea has been vastly overblown. That's my main point today. Some people in Korea might be turning it into an issue, but it is not an issue for public discussion today. Korea has a vibrant political life. People are engaged to a high degree in politics, to a degree that I think we rarely see in other parts of the world. Koreans celebrate politics. That's something that people in most democracies today have forgotten how to do. So we have a good sense for what public engagement looks like in South Korea. It involves discussion of a given topic on wildly popular independent programs, and it involves comment from the country's prominent public intellectuals. Anyone who takes the train can see it's not that people are just listening to K-pop, they're listening to political commentary. These uh, political commentary channels are extremely popular within Korea. And with the nuclear acquisition issue, we're seeing none of the signs of engagement in public life. 
It is rarely discussed in the main programs, and it's really not at the top of people's minds. There are, of course, internal discussions happening among defense researchers and within research institutions. There are serious arts on this topic, but this is not the same as public or partisan engagement of the topic. So what has happened? Well, aware of surveys showing popular support for acquiring nuclear weapons, politicians, a set of politicians, have thrown out statements about wishing for nuclear weapons. Many of the statements are frankly ridiculous. And this is, I'm saying ridiculous, not from my perspective, but, but from the perspective of an educated Korean. Oftentimes the statements are grammatically incorrect or contain logically inc inconsistent claims. And yet these claims get picked up by international media and treated as serious. Again, to many Koreans, these are obviously not considered opinions. They are sound bites. And in fact, of course, many figures have had to walk back the comments that they made on this issue. These politicians are following a playbook that's been developed over the last couple of years. They find surveys that show substantial support for an extreme or fringe position on a really important issue. Then they put out extreme statements that get media attention and bait the opposition to criticize them. This is a new technique from the last couple of years in Korean politics. They did this with anti-feminism in 2021, 2022, and they did it again with anti-China sentiment in 22, 23. South Korea has major problems, of course, around gender equity and around relations with China. Instead of taking on these tough issues and talking about them in a sophistic sophisticated way, what this group has done is to go for simple messages that gain attention and electoral support. The trouble, though, is that they have no substantive policies to back up the rhetoric. There's no next step in the anti-feminism agenda, no policy, and neither is there one on the anti-China agenda. There is a great void. Now they have done arguably the same thing with nuclear acquisition. They see surveys that show that nuclear acquisition is a popular idea, and they nod in its direction to get attention. And again, there is no considered view that is coming out. To be clear, this is not a shortcoming of democracy or of politics. It's an artifact of a new style of politics that has been championed recently by particular actors in Korea. There is a serious issue here, no doubt. And in pockets, we have this being discussed seriously. And those discussing it are having a very difficult time. I rather pity defense specialists who are trying quietly, responsibly to work on these things. They have a very difficult job because wider attention to the topic means that it gets hijacked. Publicly though, the topic has been used mostly just to gain attention. Politicians do not draw attention to the serious considerations to a potential debate on this topic. In fact, they're deliberately evading those considerations. And I think this is basically an insult to Korean people, and it's really the opposite of responsible statecraft. And I'll end my comments here. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, because I want this to be a feisty debate, not a scripted discussion. Uh, just heads up during the moderated discussion, I might ask you and Carl to respond to each other um, on a certain points. Um, Boram, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so I examined how South Korea could acquire nuclear weapons in two ways. So namely by pursuing enhanced nuclear latency and by developing its own nuclear arsenal with primary emphasis on how this could impact inter-Korean relations. Now it's challenging, if not impossible, to separate inter-Korean relations with South, Koreans, uh, South Korea's relationship with the US, China, and everybody else, right? But still, I think Clint gave me this homework because it's hypothetically <laughs> useful to think about these things to inform ourselves about this issue. And I also have a disclaimer, this is all me, it's not Kaida. And also, I'm not a nuclear expert. So I'm borrowing lots of things from other people. My bullet points are very loaded, so each bullet point is a paper. So please <laughs> bear with me. So first, South Korea acquiring enhanced nuclear latency. And so by nuclear latency, I'm generally saying that it's, it's having technical c capacity to make nuclear weapons. There are other ways to become nuclear latent, and it's not part of this paper. So in these terms, South Korea already has nuclear latency because it has a large civilian nuclear infrastructure and thus has the potential to produce a bomb. But unlike Japan, it does not have the means to make fissile material, which is the most difficult step. Japan has a substantial stockpile of plutonium repossessed from spent fuel under agreement with the US. 
Now, as part of a hedging strategy, South Korea can pursue technologies, facilities, exp expertise, etc., to be able to enrich and reprocess nuclear material rapidly and reduce its breakout time. Because this is short of owning nuclear weapons, advocates say this is legitimate. Uh, South Korea can avoid sanctions or any uh, uh, withdrawal of military assistance. So the question is, how would this impact inter-Korean relations? In theory, this could first create a nuclear balance on the Korean Peninsula, as South Korea would have a tacit or virtual nuclear deterrent. Second, it could, uh, it could empower South Korea during a nuclear crisis, whereas North Korea is increasingly more likely to use tactical nuclear weapons early on. So if South Korea had the capability to retaliate with nuclear weapons, given some time lag, or maybe it threatened that it could do it in a credible manner, then North Korea would think twice before launching an attack. Third, enhanced nuclear latency could provide political leverage in negotiations with North Korea. So that was in theory. In practice, however, it would be difficult to expect improvement in inter-Korean relations. Well, first, ROK-US relations would be strained. Revising the cooperation agreement on the civil use of autonomous energy is an uphill endeavor. When South Korea demanded equal re reprocessing rights with Japan, US argued that the circumstances were different. This could be seen as a double standard and create grievances. Any sign of weakening alliance or trilateral cooperation could embolden North Korea. Second, although South Korea has accumulated moral capital by, by upholding the non-proliferation regime until now, would other states consider its advanced nuclear latency as assuring or legitimate? Rather, they may pursue latent nuclear capacities of their own and accelerate the arms race. This would further trigger North Korea's militarization and hardly create an environment conducive to diplomacy. Third, once South Korea acquires enhanced nuclear latency, it would be a non-starter for denuclearization talks with North Korea. It would say that this violates the spirit of the NPT and et cetera. So next, building indigenous nuclear capabilities. So what's the rationale behind this? Advocates claim that first, nuclear armament may create a balance of fear on the Korean Peninsula that could enhance strategic stability, all big words. A nuclear South Korea would be free from concerns that the US may not sacrifice San Francisco for Seoul when confronted by North Korea's second strike capabilities. Noting South Korea's own capabilities rather than US willingness or commitment to extended deterrence, North Korea may think twice before waging an attack. Second, should strategic stability be reached, the inter-Korean arms race would reach a lull and conditions, and conditions for arms control may be met. Third, some US scholars have argued that this option would enable South Korea to effectively deter North Korea without straining relations with China. Now, if South Korea had its own nuclear arsenal, it would no longer need to strengthen its ties with the US, and so it would cease to antagonize China. That's the logic. However, whether South Korea's nuclear armament would improve inter-Korean relations is uncertain due to the stability-instability paradox. It's possible that, the, that North Korea may become even more fixated with its nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons program. The race to enhance nuclear capabilities and delivery systems may accelerate and intensify the inter-Korean arms race. And in this environment, the two Korea's nuclear posture would lean toward actual use rather than use of last resort. And this would lower the threshold of actually using nuclear weapons and increase instability, not the other way around. Second, South Korea would be particularly vulnerable between when it withdrew from the NPT and when it built a substantial and credible nuclear deterrent. It would become an easy target. So the prospect of North Korea entering into negotiations would diminish if South Korea somehow looked weak. And third, since both Koreas are advancing preemptive defense strategies and strike capabilities, the probability of misperception and miscalculation may increase and hamper relations. The likelihood of a nuclear crisis would increase. So what needs to be underlined here is how South Korea builds its own nuclear weapons. So on the one hand, if South Korea loses its moral ground by developing its own nuclear weapons without international consent or approval, its di diplomatic capacity, among other capacities, will weaken. And so its ability to harness the multilateral support needed to deal with North Korea would be significantly reduced, and inter-Korean relations would deteriorate. On the other hand, 
If South Korea's nuclear armament is somehow recognized as necessary by the key stakeholders, maybe following North Korea's next nuclear test, for example, it may bolster its bargaining leverage. Now, I've talked about a lot of possibilities, not definites. So, while South Korea considers its nuclear options, it would be worthwhile to explore ways to shift the, the age-old denuclearization narrative towards one of nuclear responsibilities. So when we talk about so whether South Korea should build its own nuclear weapons, we, th we think about it in terms of costs and consequences, but we rarely do think about it in terms of responsibilities. I think that's lacking in the narrative. So in closing, the two, new, uh, the two options I just talked about for, uh, for South Korea going nuclear entails higher costs and responsibilities and benefits for inter-Korean relations. Currently, there's just too much uncertainty for South Korea to reorient and reprogram its national policy to build its own nuclear uh, weapons. Prior to this, a thorough analysis of South Korea's contingent North Korea policy, as well as its nuclear policy and posture needs to be considered carefully. Now, focusing on South Korea's nuclear options alone seem to create an imbalance between deterrence and assurance. Strong assurance mechanisms are needed to move any type of negotiations with North Korea forward, and I'm, we, I'm sure everybody knows that. Nevertheless, I think there is value in sustaining the nuclear armament debate. It urges South Korean policymakers to think seriously about its security options. It signals to North Korea and the U.S. that reassurance and credibility, and credibility are evolving concepts. South Koreans are uneasy, to put it lightly, and they want more agency. The reality is that the shadow of North Korea's nuclear miscalculation looms, and South Korea needs to prepare against the absolute deterioration of U.S.-China relations that will be consequential to its national security. I'll stop there. Thank you, Baram. Uh, we'll move on to moderated discussion now to ensure that we get maximum number of questions. Let's stick our answers to two or three minutes, maybe. I'll start with a general question that Carl um, preemptively striked me, I must say. Um, well, I'm not approaching this from the perspective of being cynical about the polls, but more about trying to ex ex understand why it turns out like that. Polls that you cited in your paper, they do weirdly show a very continued consensus between different demographics, age cohorts, gender. Um, political affiliations, and living in South Korea, I feel that polarized demographics every single day. And it's interesting that there is a continued consensus. Um, and, but then also, it's not, like you also said, it's not something that people talk about that much in their daily lives, so, unless they're asked. So my, I guess my question is, why does an average South Korean say yes to a question asking, do you want nuclear weapons? Um, what explains that? What are the factors? And how should policymakers interpret that? I mean, that's where you get into kind of the speculative nature of this. Because when you go through the data and, and run cross tabs and try to try to define, you know, what are the actual driving factors of this, nothing really comes mm. out as as, poten <laughs> uh, as as explicitly driving it. So you have to be a bit of a sleuth and, and try to try to start to piece the, piecing these things together. So it's it's a little from column A, right? It's a little bit of you know, China might be a threat in the future, and. and it's a little bit of column B, where North Korea is, is a current threat and, and will continue to be a, a threat in the future. There's a dash of prestige mixed in. Um, and then I, I really think there is this kind of nostalgia uh, for, for this hope that, that Korea could have been more powerful had it continued on with its clandestine program uh, from, from that. So yeah, there, there is no real clear answer. Also, I think there's, there's not a lot of, because there's no pushback that's coming from anyone in Korea. So I, Eric highlighted the fact that yes, there's, there's not much of a debate going on here. We have politicians from kind of one side. But I'll, I'll ask the question again, where, uh, where, are the, the, where is the Democratic Party in this? You know, I think that you do not want to get caught up in this back and forth where you know, the conservative, and it's usually one of the conservative politicians who are saying these things, you don't want to get caught up in that back and forth. But there, if the argument is so easy to make in a very highly polarized environment, and the easy argument is that there are going to be significant economic consequences. There will be consequences, consequences for the energy industry, uh, consequences for the alliance. Those are fairly clear, obvious arguments to make. But no one on the Democratic Party side is willing to step up and make that argument. Um, and none of the, the elite, and there is a public elite gap on this. What, the, what that looks like, we're not exactly sure uh, how big the gap is. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really curious to me that no one is willing to step up 
and present that argument. And the question then becomes, well, why not? And is it because maybe they see it as not worth it? Or is it from the Democratic Party side, they're looking and seeing that their party supporters are also in support of this, and so they don't feel the need to step up and push back. Thank you, Carl. The public, um, the, the elite and public gap is actually a, a very important one. We'll touch on that later. When I asked, what does an average South Korean think about the question, do you want nuclear weapons? I usually try it out on my dad. Like, I asked my dad, do you, do, you, do you want nuclear weapons? And he said yes, but for a very simple reason, isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a powerful thing? So, um, it's like you said, it's speculative, but I could sense that sense of nostalgia about a powerful Korea taking matters to their own, own hands, um, and so on and so forth. Um, back to you, Eric. Um, do you have anything you wanted to respond to Carl's earlier point about um, the robustness of the support in the polls? Yeah, and first I want to say um, I appreciate your comments, Jung Min, on pointing out kind of a, a vernacular view from Korea, which is I think precisely what is needed uh, abroad is to understand how, how ordinary people in Korea think uh, about this issue or, and engage it on a daily, uh, in a daily way or, or not, which I, which I think they, they really do not. Uh, the, the question, Carl raised the question of where is the response from uh, the Democratic Party or, or other, as, uh, other elements in Korean politics. I think part of the issue here is that the style in which the topic has been broached does not invite considered discussion. Again, it has been broached through sound bites that are not a particularly well thought out and do not invite debate. And so uh, we could see this on other issues. We've seen, we can see this in other parts of the world, this style of politics. It is not a, a fruitful one for inviting democratic uh, deliberation. Um, I think that is, that is part of what is going on. And of course, it is, it is a way of baiting, trying to get uh, the opposite side to say something and then to call them out for not supporting the popular will. And that, and that brings me to the other point about surveys, is that when public figures in the media or in politics cite surveys, they are, they are engaging in this theater of democratic politics. They are citing it to say, look, these surveys show what the popular will is. And if we are being democratic, then we should be listening to that. It is a symbolic exercise in building legitimacy. And we should be careful with that because democracy is not about an aggregation of personal preferences. It's about political processes, and there's no political process in, in a survey. And so I think understanding that distinction between what one finds in a survey versus what would happen in a political process, uh, like political party organizing or elections or protest or something else, can be very different. Thank you, Eric. We'll get back to some of the points that you made, but I think we have to touch on the um, US credibility issue. First, um, this is for, I think, Carl and Jennifer. Um, it caught my eye in your papers, especially Carl's, that factors the credibility uh, of US defense commitment it did not seem to be a major driver in polls asking um, if South Koreans want nuclear weapons. This is pretty counterintuitive to me. Um, this does not exactly align either with the reasonings that many politicians claim that the public wants. Um, which is the power to protect my own country, even if US won't give up San Francisco for Seoul, like Jennifer talked about. Um, and Carl pointed out, in, um, citing Dr. Sukin's study, that the main factor might be South Korea's desire to take matters to their own hands rather than a too credible US perhaps uh, escalating too quickly. And Jennifer pointed to other possible factors like North Korea policy options, Taiwan, Ukraine, gap in conventional capabilities, norms, nationalism, so on and so forth. Are these, do you think, are mutually um, compatible with each other, your views on this, um, US credibility as a non-factor? Um, or is there anything you wanted to push back on, um, on each other's points? Sure, I can start. Um, yeah, so my piece doesn't discredit the US credibility mm -hmm. concerns because there are South Koreans who argue that if push comes to shove, the US may not give up its people and its cities for South Korean cities and people. Um, but I think stepping back a bit, fundamentally, the majority of these desires for nuclear weapons highlights this want for South Korea to have greater agency and greater control over its ability to respond to 
external challenges that are evolving and uncertain and unpredictable, particularly due to these geopolitical developments. And because of that, I think it goes beyond just those questions about U.S. credibility. Yes, that's a factor, but there are a myriad of other issues at play and an, a lot more factors that are driving those concerns. Um, so yes, mutually compatible, but I think the other factors at play are the ones that are perhaps a greater influence mm. in the debate. I see. Then let me rephrase my question for Carl. Is, um, you talked about the reassurance trap. That's interesting. Um, US is stuck in a reassurance trap where uh, the more credibility goes up, somehow the polls will show that they want nuclear weapons. Um, how do you break this cycle? How, do, how does the U.S. break this cycle? I, I don't think they really can break that cycle because as soon as they start backing away to try to soften that commitment, then they inflame the elite side. Mm. And then that would really push the elite side towards saying, oh, well, maybe we do need to take this more seriously and start, start to push in, in for something uh, of a program. Um, so, yeah, I think the, US, the best course for the U.S. is basically stay where they are, continue to focus on extended deterrence, continue to try, try to do all those things. But I think this is the, the real challenge for the research moving forward is, you know, we're, we're now beyond just asking the question, do you, do you support or oppose nuclear weapons, right? We all know what that answer is going to be, and, and we're at the time where we now need to start looking at the drivers behind it and digging in. The challenge is, is that when you start to get into the consequences, you get into hypotheticals. Mm. And as the hypotheticals get longer and more specific, you undermine the question because you start leading respondents in certain ways that you're going to kind of you know, basically assure what the result is going to be. You know, you explain very specifically that, okay, the energy industry will be decimated, uh, you can lay out, and then of course they're going to then switch to, to opposition. So there's a, the, those hypotheticals I find to be very challenging. And so we, and oftentimes when the hypotheticals are done, they're done mostly by academics. And sorry to paint with the broad brush here to academics who are either online or really listening, but they're often done on a shoestring budget. Um, just the funding often isn't there, and so that often moves into online polling. The sample might not be as, as good as it can be. Uh, the question wording might not be as, as good as it can often be. And so I think we need a broader base of not only the, the, um, those, those hypotheticals in, in online and, and from the academic side, but from kind of the issue polling side of finding good ways to ask about these questions. It's, it's a real challenge, but I think that's what the next step has to be where we can start to test what U.S. credibility mm -hmm. looks like and, and draw out some other, other issues as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll go to Boram for a second about inter-Korean relations, and we will come back to the public elite gap that we have been mentioning. Um, you've talked about two scenarios, enhanced latency and um, indigenous armament. The former option, focusing more on nuclear responsibilities, it has its perks, but it sounds like it will make denuclearization talks with North Korea more difficult. The latter, you said Seoul may feel less pressure to strengthen security with the US um, and shun China, but North Korea may still perceive um, that as threat and strengthen its own nuclear arsenal as well. So to, me, to me, it sounds like either way, um, inter-Korean relations will be difficult. Um, so is there any scenario that you can think of in which South Korea going nuclear or um, enhanced latency will somehow positively impact inter-Korean relations, or is that just out of the picture going forward? Okay, well, thanks for the question. I think theoretically, I think I've outlined in the paper that there are ways that South Korea's nuclear weapons could strengthen deterrence and uphold the status quo. That's as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. The thing, the problem I have with is it doesn't translate into how to make any negotiation work. Mm -hmm. That's just not there. So I don't know how it could be positive in that sense. It's, it's too short term. Mm -hmm. oh, just follow up question. There are a few high profile politicians who argue that a nuclear South Korea will have a better chance of negotiation with a nuclear North Korea. Um, what do you think of that? I think it's very hard to say. Mm -hmm. It's hopeful. I, if it's good, I mean, if we're lucky, maybe, but I, don't, I think the chances are very low. Can I two finger on that? Even the public rejects that. Mm. The, the, the public doesn't, doesn't think that, that there would be a mutual denuclearization there. They're pretty much set on If they have them, then both countries will be nuclear and there won't be further negotiations. Mm. I well, do want to add something. Sure, sure. So in order to bring any kind of positive result, I think the, the base condition would be South Korea would need the recognition from stakeholders that at least U.S. consent that it can build its own nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a long shot, but that needs to be there at the bare minimum. So I guess we need to, maybe the next question we need to ask is, 
what are the conditions under which that we can get that consent? Like, what kind of promises does South Korea have to make? What that those kind of questions need to be thought about. Mm. I, th I think this issue is related to how the uh, People Power Party Congressman Chung Jin Sog recently talked about getting rid of suspending the 1992 mm -hmm. denuclearization declaration, <coughs> um, hinting that if we do that, South Korea will be able to get its own nuclear weapons when North Korea is already not sticking to it. So I think it's an ongoing um, discussion in South Korea about both having nuclear weapons for leverage. But I think there's a lot of space to debate, um, especially on that. Um, Eric, uh, we will talk about the, let's talk about the elite public gap a little bit. You, you wrote that democracy is not a survey, that's a quote, and elites are supposed to make tough and difficult decisions and in a representative democracy. And roughly put, the polls are conducted on randomly selected sampled individuals. And do you think there are any gaps between elites and the ordinary public on the issue of acquiring nuclear weapons or at least the gaps in reasons for pursuing um, or nuanced differences that the surveys just cannot catch and you want to elaborate? Yeah, I would. I, I, thanks for that. I would agree with the characterization that, that there is fragmentation in uh, views or discussions of this issue, but I would frame it a little bit differently. Uh, again, the, the Korean public has an astoundingly high level of political literacy. And so when something becomes an issue, people educate themselves. Um, they spend a lot of time thinking about the issues, listening on the issues, and going out on the streets and protesting if that's what's uh, necessary to do. So people have this high level of political literacy on uh, the issues of the day. Nuclear acquisition is not one of the issues of the day where those things are happening. So we, we are not getting that high level of political literacy on this issue because it's it's not one of one of those issues today. Uh, instead, we're having these populist, if you will, kinds of uh, efforts to to elicit responses on and gain attention on this issue. That said, I mean, there is a really serious issue here. Part of the reason that the topic comes up is not just because of a new political style, and that's a big part of it, but also because there are changes in South Korea's security environment. And we have uh, serious researchers, hopefully some in government, who are having serious conversations about these. But that is where the fragmentation is, I think, between private, mostly private, serious discussions on, on the issue where there is a weighing of the considerations. And in my um, you know, only anecdotal eavesdropping on those conversations, they, they seem not to be so partisan um, versus more public noise rather than Know, serious considered political engagement on the issue. So that's where I would draw the lines of fragmentation. Thank you, Eric. In a truly hybrid manner that Clint mentioned earlier, a uh, question from Jonathan Joseph Chirella from online. Um, Eric, you mentioned populist. Um, so um, I think this fits in right. Well, how, um, the, the question is how specifically do you distinguish between a politician making far populist sound bites for publicity versus an honest declaration of policy objectives. It's easy to judge in retrospect, but dot, dot, dot. Anyone wants to jump in on that? Eric, Carl, Jennifer? Yeah, I, th I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, readers of the Korean media, <laughs> media know they can, they can judge for themselves when they, when they see a, a statement in the press, and we can judge from other responses. Many of the, the, the statements that have gotten the most headlines have had to be walked back in some way, often by allies of the person who made those, made those statements. In addition, again, they have not been, been picked up in the kinds of discussion programs that, uh, that people are, are following. And so you're not getting um, a lot of analysis of, of these things. And I think that is, th those are the signals. Again, these are not picked up by surveys, but if you are doing uh, kind of more subjective, empathetic research uh, on the streets in Korea, you'll, you'll have a sense for. Thank you, Eric. We have, I believe, 25 minutes left. Um, I'll ask just two last questions and open the questions to four. Um, let's, let's talk about consequences a little bit. We mentioned it here and there, but um, by now we are used to seeing in media headlines that Eric uh, pointed to that majority of South Koreans want nuclear weapons. Uh, but I, I did always wonder if, um, like, um, how, how, how strongly the 
respondents are aware of the consequences. But like you mentioned, Carl, nobody really uh, like fully knows in detail in South Korea, even the politicians, I believe. Um, so uh, the, uh, the surveys do not, mostly do not ask th about the consequences aside from a few um, well-crafted surveys. What are some of the consequences that can be included into the discussions in South Korea right now um, that the political elite should be discussing seriously and publicly about and might be good to reflect in polls and practice? Um, and this also reminds me of the USRK tabletop exercise recently. Does uh, something like that help political elites in South Korea to understand the consequences a little better? Um, anyone who wants to answer the question, maybe Poram or Jennifer? Sure, I just have a, a quick thing to add. Um, I do think it's interesting when you look at the arguments proposed by proponents of nuclear weapons, they either overlook the consequences and argue that South Korea can withstand sanctions or, or international condemnations, or it's just viewed as one of those um, acceptable risks of nuclearization. Mm -hmm. um, this, the specific consequences or the specific sanctions that would ensue such a decision, I wouldn't say are as fleshed out as they should be. Um, so it will be important, especially the risks, risks to South Korea's nuclear energy industry um, and its economy that is dependent on exports, how those sanctions would trickle down to the everyday person should be something that is greater incorporated into these debates, because thus far when, when looking at such arguments, it isn't as nuanced as one would expect from mm -hmm. such a debate. I think talking about this more transparently, um, along with what Paul mentioned earlier um, about the cost of South Korea going non-nuclear, I think it would be very helpful for public discussion. Did you want to add anything? No, or? this is actually very helpful for me as we get ready to do another survey mm. looking at consequences. So I'm, I'm, I'm open to other ideas of what we should be asking about and how we should frame it. Mm. Can, can I add? So in terms of tabletop exercises, I think coming back to the question of responsibilities mm. rather than the harsh word of consequences, I think we need to think about who's going to pay mm -hmm. for this. It's, tax, it's taxpayers' money to build these cities, cities Mm -hmm. facilities, but it's not talked about. Where that facility is going to be, what if an ex accident occurs, who's going to pay for that or take care of that? And civil so defenses, so like yes, Andy mentioned. Yes. So that, I think, needs to be um, counted for, I think, and in, maybe in your next research. Do you do experiments as well? Generally, no. Policymakers aren't interested in them in, in, in general, and they're too long and complicated. I think she's about to persuade to, you. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm open to persuasion, but it's a hard sell. I, I, I'm not well versed in experiments, so I can only have an idea of what we could do. But um, posing a question, have a hawkish president and a dovish president, have them say the same hawkish things about having nuclear weapons or not, and see the, how the public understands those messages, I think that's better. Because if you ask about the current president, people already mm -hmm. have emotions about the current president, so mm -hmm. that's all in there. But if you have a hypothetical conservative president, a hypothetical dovish conservative uh, president, you could vary more things. It's yeah, just a suggestion. Yeah, that, that's interesting, because usually in the questions that we ask, uh, there's not a party included. We don't mention whether it's mm -hmm. you know coming from this party or that party. It's just a straight question. But also in the experiments, I haven't seen a lot of that included. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's something, something to consider, especially because you test the polarization, because this issue is not polarized mm -hmm. in, in that way. So maybe including specific parts of that might tease out some of the polarization. Yeah, that, and I'd that like to know if there are actual audience costs here for politicians or leaders saying something and mm -hmm. not following up. We know that for other topics, there really aren't any audience costs, but maybe for this, we might find something. I'm not sure. I know, Eric might be able to speak to that, because it sounds like I think I'll probably agree with him that it seems that there are not any audience uh, consequences. Or, or is it our job to make it costly? Eric, do you want to say something for 20 seconds? Please, <laughs> 20 seconds. <laughs> I, I do not have, I do not have okay. a Okay, I, I think uh, we need a, good, a group a good chat pack <laughs> room so that we can work on this. <laughs> and when we actually come up with the experiment or research, I'll tell Clint. Okay. Um, I'll open questions to the floor. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, great, great presentation. I, I hope the chairman of the next panel can do half as well. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
if, if there's nobody in the opposition pushing back, is it helpful at all for outsiders to you know, talk about the costs? Uh, I, Paul, in the last panel, pretty strongly suggested no, if I understood him correctly. And I'm just wondering what do you all think about if when US experts chime in, we're going to hear Sig Heckert at lunchtime mm -hmm. say how costly it will be. What if US officials or members of Congress chimed in? How would that affect? Would, would, would South Koreans not want that, or would it be helpful? Eric? That's tricky. That's more of a moral question. <laughs> uh, my, my, my first thought is I think that uh, th those arguments will, first of all, get less attention, although get attention in a different way to statements that are either in support or that can be, can be rewritten to be in support of nuclear uh, acquisition. I think, I think there are people in Korea who are certainly aware of the costs or consequences or responsibilities as, um, and, and Jennifer and Potom have identified some of those. Um, so I think there is, there is a, a awareness. I think showing some sophistication from the US side is not bad as well. Showing that there are, are complex views on, on the costs of doing something like this. There are also, of course, moral moral considerations. Does Korea want to be in the position of proliferating nuclear weapons? And that's something that, that people in Korea have to consider for themselves. Yeah, for, for Paul's comments, I understood them the same way, and I found myself uh, nodding my head vigorously, as I'm, I'm currently based in Korea, and so I get the chance to, to meet with all of the kind of the elite foreign policy makers. And in private discussions, you know, they, they've often circled back to this idea that all the loudest opposition is coming from the U.S. And even though they are personally, in, in most of the discussions, opposed to nuclear weapon, weapons acquisition, that a lot of the opposition coming out of the U.S. they find patronizing mm -hmm. in, in this way. Like saying that, you know, with like the threats, the open threats to destroy the economy, essentially um, undermine the, the, the nuclear energy industry. Uh, all of those things are, are, even among people who oppose nuclear weapons, it's not playing well uh, in, in those terms. Jennifer, you did mention weakening norms in your paper. Did you want to? I was actually just about to, to chime in on that. I, I do think it is important to highlight the normative costs associated with such a decision on top of the economic backlash that might ensue. Because particularly regarding the NPT and South Korea's commitment to it, how the U.S. and, and other uh, NPT signatories will respond to, yes, a legal withdrawal, uh, there is that clause in the NPT, but how exactly that will play out, I think, is also an Im important piece of looking at what a nuclear South Korea would actually look like. Um, and beyond that, just there are those advocates for nuclear weapons who argue that there may be an immediate backlash, but South Korea can get over it. The U.S. may eventually learn to accept a nuclear South Korea. But I think that process, what exactly the timeline will look like, is also something that's important to highlight, because I don't think that's fully been fleshed out yet in the discussion. I think I saw Paul's two fingers. Do you want to chime in? Yeah, just to underscore what Carl said, I think the hesitancy of South Korean bureaucrats, particularly to come out and join this discourse, on nuclear armament reflects their understanding already of the potential punitive costs. And it's actually very, we're the ones that were victim to China's economic retaliation. Mm -hmm. We are very aware of our economic vulnerability. But again, just this focus, this moral, um, argument completely dismisses the moral responsibility also to, to be able to defend your population right, and your citizens. Um, so I just don't see U.S. commentary highlighting particularly for South Korean policymakers what the costs are when I would be extremely surprised if South Korean policymakers aren't more well-versed about the pains of economic retaliation. Okay, multiple two <laughs> fingers. Um, uh, maybe we could talk more about the normative issue in the next panel because it relates to a lot of the things that the United States pursues, and especially in this arena. Do you want to? So, Paul, I take your points, uh, but I would say there's another aspect to this, which is that 
there's a debate in South Korea, and then there's a debate that goes beyond South Korea. And so from the U.S. perspective, if, we, if the U.S. doesn't highlight what the cost would be, because you know, your argument was the right to defend your population, and I don't disagree with that, but then the Iranians would say the same thing, so why shouldn't we have a nuclear weapon? So I think the U.S. is in this complex position to where it understands South Korea's constraints, but it also has to think about it in a broader picture. So we're kind of, and that's probably why I haven't seen anybody in the U.S. administration say anything, but the expert community is talking about it. Uh, oh, thank you. Talking about a consequences question that perhaps has more emotional uh, <laughs> content than some of these other issues we've been discussing, does it ever get raised, and we've discussed it in the first panel, that the first country after South Korea to get nuclear weapons, should South Korea decide to go nuclear, would be Japan? Mm. And does that issue ever come up in discussions about consequences and how uh, citizens of the ROK feel about that? Yeah, we, we asked specifically about that. Uh, they, the, 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 the ROK public, I haven't looked at these numbers in a while, um, but as far as I remember, yeah, a majority expect that that would happen. That, and this is among the, the pro, this is among the group that is pro-nuclear armament. They fully expect Japan to go nuclear very, very quickly, but it's not uh, a deterrent for their support of, of nuclear weapons. They expect and they're okay with it? Or okay with it is probably a different question, but they would expect that <laughs> as, a, as an outcome. They expect that as an outcome, and it doesn't switch their support to opposition. Mm, I see. Okay. Great panel. Congratulations, CKI. You have a wonderful conference. Uh, my question is to probe you a bit more on this whole idea of how perceptions of U.S. credibility affect elites and the population more broadly. And I don't point to the, the war in Ukraine, of course. Obviously, U.S. relations with Ukraine were nothing like U.S. relations with Korea. But at the onset, of course, we all realized the Budapest Memo is violated, which was an agreement whereby the Ukrainians gave up nuclear weapons for a guarantee of sovereignty by the United States, Europeans, and the Russians. We didn't fulfill it, and the Russians violated it. Now we have, in the last few days and weeks, as we begin our own political silly season, at least uh, two leading uh, uh, candidates for the President of the United States saying the United States would, should cease all military assistance to Ukraine and I would do so as soon as I became president. Would that affect the credibility of the United States in terms of extended deterrence for Korea? It struck me in the earlier panel, a lot of talk was one of the things that spurred this debate in the 70s, of course, was the U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam. Now, while that's not, you know, maybe a poor metaphor, it would suggest to me that if the United States now pursued that policy of no longer supporting Ukraine, how would that affect elite and public thinking in Korea? Um, yeah, I'm, there, there are those, those lines being drawn between Ukraine and South Korea, although I think as Clint mentioned, it is a false equivalency. There are various factors that are very different about the two situations. Um, but would U.S. seizing support impact the debate? Most likely, yes. It's hard to um, predict how exactly it would affect the calculus of how people think about nuclear weapons. But I think just in general, the war in Ukraine is shaping perceptions about U.S. abroad commitments and how thoroughly the U.S. is committing to those different contingencies. Um, just to add another piece back in, I do think in relation to that, the Taiwan piece will also be important in South Korean thinking about how that would impact its security environment and how then South Korea should respond to it. Um, so. Again, it's hard to really make a prediction how exactly it would impact thinking, but it will likely shift certain um, views on how South Korea should think about just the reliability of certain levels of support. Can I, I'm, I'm, excuse me, this is uncouth, oh, but I'm assuming ahead. organizer's privilege. Um, <laughs> one of the aforementioned uh, high level uh, uh, politicians did note to, to, to pull out of Ukraine so as to focus more on China. So on the one hand, maybe this could be interpreted, they put greater attention on Korea, um, but at the same time, 
On the other hand, mm -hmm. it forces exactly that dilemma of potential rock entrapment in something in Taiwan. So it's haywire, I guess, is the, the point I'm, I'm raising. Um. Thank you. Is on? Yes, thank you. I have a curious question about South Korean domestic discourse. Mm -hmm. So if credibility of U.S. extended deterrence and maybe some elements of national, nationalist pride is a contributing factor to supporters of South Korea's independent nuclear armament. In that case, even if U.S. offers as a compromise return of redeployment of U.S. tactical nukes in South Korea, would that be sufficient to satisfy those advocates of nuclear armament? Or would they say, well, even if you bring those U.S. nukes into South Korea, you can always pull them back, so this doesn't answer our question. Or have you seen the poll show that enough nuclear armament advocates would be sufficiently modified if U.S. offers, mm -hmm. here's our nukes, use them instead? So indigenous versus American tactical yes. redeployment. Carl? Yeah, we asked specifically about that. Um, and 57% are in support of redeployment of tactical nuclear weapons. The problem is, is that if you're asked to choose, if, they, if, it's, if there is a choice to be made, then it drops to something like 70% you know, versus 9%. Mm -hmm. So the high preference is for an indigenous program. Mm -hmm. Tacticals are acceptable, but not, not the preferred outcome mm -hmm. is, is, I think, how I would say that. Thank you. Um, a question for, for all the panelists. Um, where do you see this, this discourse, uh, the pro-nuclear weapons discourse going next? Um, and with the expectation that nobody probably wants to make blanket predictions, uh, what, uh, what developments, what factors do you see as being most important in influencing that discourse moving forward? Thank you. Eric? Yeah, let me just uh, say something that responds to that question as well as the, uh, the, previous, uh, the previous question. I think the previous question got at kind of the more sophisticated side. And so if we were to see this topic become something for um, engaged public discussion, that whole range of options would be laid out and there would be discussion, imagination, repackaging of the uh, costs and benefits and consequences to each of these various options rather than painting things as kind of black or white or yay, we're strong and have nuclear weapons, right? I think that is that is one direction a more sophisticated uh, public discussion in Korea could take. It hasn't taken uh, taken that direction. But I, I also just want to warn against trying to draw an equivalency between purported public sentiment in favor of this and what the government does. Those can be entirely different things, right? Again, it's partly a symbolic legitimizing activity to try to cite the uh, public public sentiment. But what is done by this administration may be entirely separate to any discussions uh, or, or public views uh, about that. And I think that is that is something that is uh, risky and, and frightening to, to everybody. Uh, just quickly about the, uh, sorry, do you wanna? Is that, do you have a follow-up? You can go first. Well? Uh, so on, on the, the follow-up to this, I, you know, I think there is an increasing depth to the conversation. I, I don't know if everyone saw it, but there was a, a very detailed interview given by Egan. He's the a professor at SNU, former, for him, former head of the Korea Foundation. Um, he's now out of that. But he gave a pretty in-depth uh, explanation of why he supports a, a nuclear armament. And I think the next steps we'll see is following on that. No one's put enough thought into it yet about what this is going to look like, what a thought-out program will look like. But the seeds are there. So if people like him, who is a very serious uh, policy thinker and, and a serious player, is starting to put the pieces together, it's not long until others are going to start following in behind. So I, I take Eric's point that there hasn't been a serious discussion yet, but the seeds are there. And the people who are talking about this and, and thinking about it are going to start coming up with more serious plans, I think, in, in the near future. Um, and I also think just look it's crucial to look at the long-term viability of the debate, because it is something that, to, in one form or the other, has been part of South Korean thinking since at least 2006 when North Korea became or had tested its nuclear weapon. Um, and because of that, I think as long as North Korea has usable nuclear weapons and that the Korean Peninsula is not fully denuclearized, this debate, again, it's difficult to assess the exact form in one form or the other, though, will continue to be part of the discourse. Poram, do you want to Sure. Um, I guess two things come to mind to answer your question is the next nuclear test of North Korea that would spark some kind of 
reaction and also U.S. elections. North Korean nuclear weapons test. We have been hearing about it for more than a year. It didn't happen yet. Uh, I'm still waiting. Um, we have three minutes left. I'll get three questions per time to ensure everybody um, gets their question in here. Um, Kayla, and then in the back. So Carl mentioned the word acceptable uh, in his last response. And I think that is a really interesting prompt to think about the public discussion. Um, so to what extent can we differentiate support, which is kind of passive, from demand? Yeah. And then under what conditions? And I think that I'd like to hear Carl talk about that, but also Boram as well, um, since he's talking about responsibilities. And I think acceptability falls into that. Uh, let's take questions from uh, Kayla. Hi, my question builds a little bit on the question just um, happened earlier, and that is playing forward with the hypothetical. Jennifer mentioned a great point that if we do see a futuristic scenario, so definitely playing with hypotheticals, where Korea does choose to go nuclear, we have that gap period, with the withdrawal period for the NPT, and being a country that is democratic and beholden to the, the conversations that are had in the public, if sanctions ensue or things of that nature, or things aren't moving forward, what does this even look like if it has to be reversed? Mm -hmm. So what does it look like if the South Korean public changes their mind, mm -hmm. if you know, politicians change their mind, they say, "Oh, we're going this direction." You know, we're seeing the consequences of it, and we pull back. What risk is there for that economically and militarily and strategically? And I think we're asking great questions at the forefront of this hypothetical, but I'm really curious about the midpoint as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe for Jennifer, uh, and in the back, please. Yes. Thanks. Um, okay. Deterrence has many levers to it, nuclear being just one of them. I'm curious about, we've talked a lot about nuclear today, understandably, that's the point of our, of our day here together. I'm curious about the state of public polling with respect to other capabilities, cyber, um, a global striker, non-nuclear conventional, electronic warfare, space. These are all areas of um, development that could feasibly uh, impact the deterrence calculus of certain actors. So I'm curious about whether experiments regarding polling on nuclear weapons can either take those other levers into account um, or, or kind of what the state of play is there. Thank you. Well, let's start with Carl on the first question. Oh, uh, so I was going to go with that okay, question. Sure. It's, it's that, that's probably a shorter answer and there isn't any. Um, because nuclear is a big issue and everyone has a baseline understanding of what that is, but cyber electronic space, there's just no public understanding and so we can't really ask about that and get kind of any, any kind of reliable results. Jennifer, do you want to? Right, uh, just to answer Kayla's question, I, I think it will be very interesting to see, because already going forward with nuclear development is a risk and that, in type, and that comes with vulnerabilities, particularly in that period, and if there is that reversal, how exactly then South Koreans view both its vulnerability conventionally and <coughs> nuclearly um, in response to North Korea, I think will, will really impact how the debate then looks at just South Korea's indigenous capabilities beyond nuclear within its uh, geostrategic context. Carl, just quickly on the... Yeah, that's, a, that's an important distinction. So there is support, but there's, I don't think there's any demand uh, whatsoever. I think that'll be something that'll end up being driven if there's an elite shift on this then that would end up creating like an actual demand for that. Okay, final question where um, it's 11.50, we have to wrap up. Uh, there's a question from online from Dr. Jeffrey Robertson, do panelists see a generation gap in support for nuclear weapons? Uh, mm -hmm. Poram, do you see any generation gap in South Korea? Um, I, don't, I don't know the polling data mm -hmm. as much as Carl does, but I did have a question. So if the seven, even in the 70% that says yes, mm -hmm. there are old people and young people, correct? All people Roughly can have put. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> older people and younger people. So yeah. older people may have nostalgia. Younger people don't have nostalgia. Yeah. So mm -hmm. my understanding of the younger generation is they were born with the notion that K-pop was universal. I'm not part of their generation. I've just learned about BTS. Oh, I'm old now then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I think their expectations are different. They're much higher. So they want more recognition. So I think the drivers would be very different there. But also for younger generation women and men, they have very different ideas of what the country's like. Um, Eric or Carl, did you want to say anything about generation gap or non-existence of generation gap in Uh Nothing beyond just majorities of all generations mm -hmm. uh, of all age cohorts supported. I can't remember what the variations are. There's probably some in there, but well, they're- Women slightly lower, I remember. That might just be right. Just very slightly. Yeah, but they're re the, the gaps are relatively minimal. Mm -hmm. 
Eric? Hey, yeah, I would just say, I think the, the question from the, the last speaker and then Kayla's question were, are excellent. And I think where there is the real discussion of, uh, of these issues in Korea, that is among security researchers in more private uh, spaces, I think those things are coming up uh, as they should. We're just not seeing it re reflected. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, we're off to lunch now. Just, um, uh, Clint? Just very quickly. Um, fantastic job, everybody, in the, on the second panel. Um, Thank you.